season. Blame it on the weather, I'll blame it for no reason. On a feather, you can blame it on a falcon. But please stay with me. Blame it on the game, blame it on the batter, I'll blame it on my name. It doesn't matter, you can blame it on a Hogan. But please stay with me. The magic kicks off. Blame it on a fish, blame it on the ocean, I'll blame it on his kiss. If you get the notion, you can blame it on a Vulcan. Sir, it's awesome that you had that mandolin. I am just walking by. That's the community appeal of this story. A little recap, because it's been a couple weeks. In episode nine of Blame It on Hoboken, Carolyn Cates, a tour guide specializing in overlooked landmarks, has hired Jimmy Foss, a tough talking matchmaker from Hoboken, to find the most mo normal man in New York City. She's on a deadline, which may be why she's hired Jimmy, a man only she can see. As we know, Jimmy has matched Carolyn with a wonderful man named Ned Allen. We love Ned. And he is helping Carolyn take the five steps to love with Ned. But when Carolyn tries to reunite Jimmy with his family to say thank you, Jimmy disappears. Her deadline for love is fast approaching, and Carolyn turns and proposes the fifth step to love to Ned, and he accepts. Now all she has to do is plan a wedding and find a site for Righteous Records, her most difficult client to date, a site with a hidden pop song inside it before she turns 32, which is mm, in about three days. Now, episode 10 of Blame It on Hoboken. Carolyn and Ned had divided their wedding to-do list into two parts. Carolyn was going to take the odd-numbered items on the list and Ned was taking the evens. Ned called Carolyn that night from his motel room in Indianapolis. He was traveling for business. He'd been meeting with officer furniture, office furniture clients most of the day, but he'd managed to sneak in a little wedding to-do list work between his appointments. Carolyn and Ned had checked off item one on their list, the guest list, the night before when they had met with Katan Katan. The second item on the list was Ned's, and that was the wedding dinner. My sisters connected us with a friend of theirs who's a caterer, Ned told Carolyn. He suggested we keep things simple, yet delicious and local wherever possible. And for dessert, he said we should offer our guests miniature danishes, in addition to the wedding cake in honor of the danishes we ate on our first date. <gasps> you told him about the danish? That's really sweet of you. Carolyn giggled at the unattended pun. Sweet. You remembered that's what we ate on our first date, danish? I mean, that's really impressive. Well, Ned said, our first date was only a couple of weeks ago. And besides, I won the last Danish. Still, Carolyn said, that's a really romantic thing to do. That is romantic, isn't it, Ned said. The third item on their wedding to-do list was music, and that was Carolyn's responsibility. And so she told Ned how Natalie Martino from Righteous Records had insisted on providing the wedding band. Oh, that's really a nice thing for her to offer, Ned said. Well. Carolyn said. It was more of a command than an offer, but I agree, it's a really nice thing for her to do. Just don't tell Natalie Martino that you thought it was nice when you meet her. She thinks nice is an insult. In my business, Ned told Carolyn, we call clients like that a three-legged stool. Unbalanced, off-center, and a little crappy to deal with sometimes. 
Carolyn laughed so hard she snorted. I'm never going to look at Natalie Martino the same way again, she told Ned. The fourth item on the list were place cards for the wedding dinner. I looked up some local printers and I found one called Arrow Printing, Ned said. Now it was near the top of the list because it begins with the letter A, but I also picked it because it's near your apartment and I mean I thought you liked the name, you know, so I called. The woman I spoke to penciled you in for a two o'clock appointment, so things are set there unless... No, no, Arrow Printing sounds perfect. Carolyn wrote down the address Ned gave her. And two o'clock, I mean, that's a great time. I have a tour in the morning and I'm meeting with Righteous Records at four o'clock. A little pause popped into their patter at that point. It wasn't an awkward pause. It was more of a comfortable pause. And that was something to savor in itself. Hey, Ned, Carolyn said. Yeah, Carolyn, you're the best. You know that? Takes one to know one, Ned said. And there was another pause. Hey, uh, Ned. Yeah, Carolyn? Can I ask you a personal question? Um, sure. I mean, go ahead. Are you smiling? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Me too. There was another pause. Ned? Yeah, Carolyn? I'm really glad we're doing this together. I'm glad too, Carolyn. I mean, who would have thought a few weeks ago, I mean, you know... Ned? Yeah, Carolyn? Um, she didn't need to hear him say anything. She just wanted to hear the sound of his voice. Good night, Ned. Good night, Carolyn. And hey, good, good luck with the Arrow guys. They made a phone date for the next day and they hung up the phone. Now, Ned clicked on the TV in his uh, motel room and settled in to watch a talk show. Carolyn put away her to-do list and put herself on pause, head on pillow for the rest of the night. Chapter 20. Carolyn was inventing jaunty slogans for arrow printing as she walked from the subway to the address that Ned had given her. <coughs> Some of them were arrow printing, let us hit your target. Arrow printing, a bullseye on design. She was surprised and a little bit impressed by her current level of silliness. I mean, she was a practical person normally, rationally romantic, sensitive, yet full of common sense. But marriage seemed to be upsetting her priorities. Impractical was her new practical, and happy was her new normal. When she arrived at the address Ned had given her, Carolyn's happiness, however, turned to weariness. Arrow Printing's offices were located in the grayest, grimmest building she had ever seen. It was a sunny spring day, but when she crossed the street to the building's front door, the metal awning over the doorway eclipsed the daylight. The time was five minutes to two, but the atmosphere was reading ominous sundown. Now the front doors of the buildings had no knobs and they had no handle, just a faded gray sign that read, visitors use loading dock. The path to the loading dock was as rough as the sign on the door and just as gray. Broken bits of glass mixed with the small rocks and things that might have been one or the other before the dust covered them. Carolyn looked down at her feet and sighed. She had worn a pair of open-toed sandals to her meeting at Arrow Printing. It seemed fitting that the bride should personally convey the elegance she wanted to see in print. Next time I'll wear hiking shoes, she muttered as she stumbled across the unpaved gravel area that led from the front door to Arrow Printing's loading dock on her sandals high wedge soles. She started to cross the lunar-looking surface when, ow, a pea-sized piece of gravel wedged itself between the arch of her foot and the sole of her shoe. The little pebble had found the perfect pressure point, the one marked maximum pain. And that leads to our song of the night, which is called Pebble with a Cause. at how quickly your second I could have, you could have stayed up here but I'll just keep vamping fortunately Paul is a pro still top flighty, a little stone, but kind of mighty, sorry, but I got a job to do, I'm a pain in the neck and a thorn in 
your side up and tacking your tire when you try to ride on the pebble in your shoe. Now it wasn't a job, I went and applied for it's a natural fact. I was cut and died for a leader of this ragged and rocky crew. Hey's pretty lousy, most people curse me. I play cat and mousey and get kind of thirsty, I'll wait. Mostly I think that you'll find I'm a speed bump bump of a different kind Stop and say hello on your way through An acorn grows into a great big tree I've got a hidden gem in me Stop and say hello on your way through But it's true Now you and I, we found each other This fleeting visit's worth the bother In my rough and humble point of view well, If you look really closely I think that you'll find I'm a speed bump bump of a different kind Stop and say hello on your way through An acorn grows into a great big tree Mr. Paul Kiddick on the mandolin. You may have recognized him as the gentleman who played the theme song. There are twins. All right, so Carolyn has a pebble in her shoe. Carolyn hopped over to the cement floor of the loading dock, freed the pebble out of her sandal, and tossed it back among its neighbors in the field. The sign on the wall of the loading dock read, Arrow Printing, Second Floor. An arrow next to the door pointed upstairs. Part of the arrow's tail was missing. Maybe it had been lost to the ravages of time, or maybe, Carolyn thought, as she yanked the rusty door open, it had fled in self-defense. She walked up a dimly lit set of concrete stairs to the second floor. Arrow printing was the only business on the floor, and so she rang the small rectangular bell by the entrance. Wait for the click, pull and enter, a nasal sounding voice said over the intercom. The door clicked open. Carolyn pulled and stared. Arrow Printing's reception area made the outside hallway look inviting. The furniture was gunmetal gray. The floor was cement. A set of iron latticed windows on the room's north side transmitted just enough sunlight to highlight the dust motes floating in the musty air. Welcome to Arrow Printing. A woman seated at a gray metal desk waved Carolyn inside with one hand and held the receiver of her desk phone with the other. The nameplate on her desk read Vonda Jones. She wore a pair of red, rhinestone-studded cat's eye-shaped reading glasses and a pale pink cardigan sweater tied around her shoulders like a superhero's cape. Yeah, a root canal hurts like a, a root canal, but I gotta go. I got a customer. Yeah, Vonda said. Me too. See you tonight, okay? Okay, okay, me too. Yeah, yeah, bye. Please excuse the delay, Vonda Jones told Carolyn. You're our two o'clock, the bride in a rush. Arrow Printing congratulates you on your joyous upcoming event. <laughs> she led Carolyn down a dimly lit corridor to a door marked Samples and Private Orders. The door looked as dull and despondent as the rest of the office, but then Vonda opened the door. Carolyn smiled in relief. The samples room was less like a morgue and more like a museum. Her inner tour guide went to work immediately taking in the sights. The three of the room's four walls were covered with framed wedding invitations. The first wall featured invitations written in heavy calligraphy, as if inviting the guest to a meeting with a foreign head of state. The second wall was more modern looking and yet still antique. The designs on it dated from the 1970s, Carolyn guessed. 
There were invitations with rainbows running across them and typefaces with drop shadows that seemed to make each marriage a cross between a, a science fiction novel and an album cover for a heavy metal hairband. Carolyn tried to picture the brides and grooms that had purchased them long ago, long-haired, captain-draped. Do you, like, um, take your old lady to be, uh, like, your old lady? The officiant would have said. Like, wow, dude, yeah, I do, the happy groom would have answered. Cosmic, yeah, like, whoa, the barefoot bride would agree. The third wall of Arrow Printing Samples Room was covered in invitations of a more muted style. Not as fancy as the formal calligraphy, but not as countercultural as the mod invitations. Carolyn turned her attention to the fourth wall, which occupied the front of the room. A vintage photograph framed in heavy wood was mounted there. The man in the photograph held a drafting tool in one hand and a pair of spectacles in the other. You look like someone I'd like to know, Carolyn said to the man in the photograph. Now, the man in the photograph didn't say anything, of course. He was a photograph. But Carolyn's good humor was back, and she continued to chat with him. So, you're the quiet type, she said. I can appreciate that. My name's Carolyn. What's yours? Then she read the plaque below the photograph. Ned, Alan, you are more amazing than you know, she shouted. Seeing this photograph was like finding a long-lost relative. My arrow heart thrice flies to thee my one true love eternal. Carolyn recited aloud. Could there be a better sign? She read the name on the plaque one more time to be sure of the man in the photograph, but it was true. The man in Arrow Printing's office photograph was Enid Hobbs' beloved architect. It is so nice to meet you, Carolyn told Enid Hobbs' true love. Yeah, well, it's nice to meet you too. A man in a gray suit entered the room carrying an order book in his hand. Carolyn could see his reflection in the glass that covered the architect's photo. So we're here to talk wedding place cards, am I right? I am, I, we are, but can I ask you first, where did you get this photograph? I know this man, Carolyn said, still staring at the glass. I mean, not personally, but historically, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his, actually. Yeah, you and a lot of other people, the gray-suited man said. Now, Carolyn thought she'd heard his voice somewhere before, but she was too focused on the photograph to wonder where she'd heard it. The architect's face was so kind looking. His posture was upright and he held his eyeglasses so lightly yet surely. She could imagine him designing Enid Hobbs' home right there on the desk in the forefront of the photo. Uh, that guy was my great great uncle on my mother's side, something like that, the man in the gray suit was saying in the background. But if you ask me, he's one of history's all time losers. Guy thinks he loves this dame. So far, so good. And then she dies at a very young age, which is sad, I agree, but. What does my illustrious insect or, uh, ancestor do? Does he pick himself up and start all over again? No, sir. He mopes and pines, pines and mopes until the Green Reaper says, Green Reaper, Reaper says, all right already, and puts the guy's lovelorn keister in a plain pine box. <laughs> End of story, some people will say. But what do you want to bet that when the clock hits zero, Mr. Mopey thinks, hey, maybe I should have had a little more fun when I had the chance. But by then, it's lights out time, game over. Like I said, the guy's a loser. But this picture doesn't say that at all, Carolyn said. Look at his eyes. Look at the way he's standing. This is a man who'd made a choice. He's not a loser. He's just someone who's at home with his own company. And that's a really brave choice, in my opinion. Ah, there's nothing brave about being lonely, said the man in the gray suit. And there's nothing smart about living alone. Life is like Noah's Ark. Everything should come in twos. <laughs> now, I grant you. The old man here lived in different times. He didn't have a Noah to fix him up, but I think he could have benefited from some old online dating or a dirty movie, maybe. <laughs> you feel down, you watch one of those, and well, I'll end that comment here. We're in mixed company, but my point is, young lady, they say my uncle was some sort of romantic hero, but if you ask me, all he needed was a helping uh, hand, and poof, he would have been back in the saddle romantically. Bye-bye, dead poet lady. Hello, Ark. Well, that's just a pretty harsh interpretation of the story, don't you think? Carolyn said. I mean, what about the symbol of the arrows and the heart that the ar architect and Enid created to symbolize their love? It's beautiful and it's made, of, it's made hundreds of people happy. What about the poem that Enid wrote for your uncle? And, and what about the song? A song. A song. I don't know what you're referring to, the man in the gray suit said. But his tone of voice told a different story. Oh, come on. You know Arrow of Love. Carolyn turned around and studied the man. 
It was inspired by the poem that Enid Hobb wrote for your uncle, and it's the biggest song of the year. The radio's been playing it, DJs play it in clubs, my dry cleaner plays it. It's impossible to miss. Yeah, well, uh, we don't keep our radio here, the man made a dismissive sound. And my wife takes in my dry cleaning. But yeah, maybe I've heard that song, uh, somewhere. But let me tell you something. Arrow of Love is overrated. And suddenly, Carolyn knew where she'd heard that voice. She spun around and did a double take, and for that second time in an hour, her double take proved her right. The man standing in front of her now was the chairman of the board from the Friends of Frank's Club in Hoboken. Tom Ross, the man in the gray suit said, holding out his hand. Carolyn Cates, Carolyn said, offering him hers. I've met you before, haven't I, Tom Ross said. Give me a second, I never forget a face. And then he took a step back. Oh no, oh no, you're that crazy broad. The one who jumped up on our stage. The gray seat demeanor of Tom Ross shifted into the furious confidence of the eldest Frank. I'm sorry about what happened to your club, she said. Aw, oh, sorry. Sorry does not cut it, young lady, the fourth Frank said. You young people today, you think the world is all about you. You've got no respect for tradition. you got no thought for your elders. But now, I guess it's safe to say you found your missing friend. Because here you are, getting married in a New York minute. Well, congratulations to you both. I hope you'll be very happy. Oh, thank you, Carolyn said. I, I know what I did was wrong, but it was the only thing I could do, and I still haven't found my friend. What I really need to do is find him before my wedding. And honestly, sir, I think you'll be glad when I do. Oh, why would I care about your friend, the chairman of the board said. I got all the friends I need. Carolyn glanced back at the photograph of Enid Hobbs' architect. He looked calm and kind, so, and confident, so she borrowed a little of that. You should care about my friend because indifference is overrated, she told Tommy Ross. The word got his attention, just like she hoped it would. And because I think you care about him, too. You and your ex-wife had three children, am I right? The chairman of the board played it cool. Well, which ex-wife? He shrugged. I got a few. I'm talking about Maureen, Carolyn said. You know Maureen? the chairman said. We've, we've met, Carolyn said. And the two of you, you have a daughter and two sons, am I right? But you haven't seen the younger son in a very long time. The chairman of the board's bravado gave way at those words. The lines around his mouth went slack. His expression was pained. Look, Jimmy Foss's father, Tom Ross, said, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you think you're doing, but you can't help me. If you have real business to conduct here, I'll take your money. But this other conversation is over. Do you understand? What? Carolyn wanted to argue, but there was nothing she could say. O okay. Okay, then. Wedding reception place cards, am I right? Tom Ross said. We have a lovely selection of those, one of which will surely fit your needs. <laughs> he opened a sample book on the table. Ooh, this one looks nice, Carolyn said, pointing to a white card embossed with a pattern of pale green arrows interspersed with tiny sky, sky blue hearts. Can I get 200 of these by tomorrow? Rush, Tom Ross wrote at the top of her order page. Anything else I can do? Yes, um, yes there is, Carolyn was saying to her own surprise. Her tongue was outpacing her brain again. Think, she told herself. And then she knew what she had to say. We, um, we, we need a wedding band, she lied. Is that so? Tom Ross looked up from his order form. Oh, we were thinking of hiring a DJ, Carolyn said, baiting the hook. A DJ, Tom Ross's face flushed. You young people, you don't know what's what, he said in his most powerful chairman of the board voice. Forget the DJ. You just booked the Friends of Franks. When and where is this blessed union of yours taking place? Carolyn wrote down the details on Tom Ross's order pad. We'd be honored if you and your wives would attend the ceremony as well, she said, casting her line into the sea of possibility. Well, I guess we could do that, the fourth Frank said. The wives love a good wedding, but I'll warn you, I cried at all four of mine. <laughs> so it's a deal, Carolyn said. Solid as stone, the fourth Frank said. Now, Carolyn's next to-do item was professional. She was taking the group from Righteous Records to the site she called the Broken Sea. It was a school of sea glass fish attached to the branches of trees hidden behind an overgrown doorway beneath the West Side Highway. This is magnificent and evocative and humble at the same time, James said. 
We could bring someone here and have them write a song about this place. It's such an otherworldly idea. No one would believe it was real, and we could surprise them. Yes, it is real and still magical. What do you guys think? Well, while Natalie Martino and her group debated James's idea, Carolyn checked for the photograph she left for Jimmy Foss at the base of the tree in the center of the sea. The photograph was still there. Carolyn sighed a sigh of why. And once again, Natalie Martino overheard her, just as she had at the Whispering Benches. I'm with you, Natalie Martino said. I wish this were the place, but it's not. So uh, what else can you show us today, Carolyn? Nothing, Carolyn replied honestly. You know what? I, I feel like I'm failing you. If you want to fire me, I I'd understand. <sighs> it's too late to hire someone else, Natalie Martino said. So you're stuck with us and we're stuck with you. Sure, our jobs and careers are on the line here, but hey, don't worry about us. Natalie Martino paused to let the guilt sink in. I'm, I'm sure you'll come through. Having delivered her version of a pep talk, Natalie led the Righteous Records team back to their black town cars. Carolyn could almost see the cloud of misery that followed them as the cortege drove away. When she got back to her office, Wendy, Carolyn's intern, her high school intern, was updating the password on the Jimmy Foss page of True City Tours website. Hey, thanks for inviting Rodney and me to your wedding, Wendy said as Carolyn sat down beside her. How's your to-do list going, by the way? Not bad, Carolyn said. We've got the caterer and the band and the place cards and the dress. And you have your maid of honor already, so that's done, Wendy added. Aggie! Carolyn jumped up from her seat and headed out the door. Wendy, lock up when you leave, okay? You did tell Aggie you're getting married, right? Wendy called after Carolyn. It was impossible. It was unthinkable. But it was true. She'd forgotten to tell Aggie. Aggie's uh, studio didn't have a sign on the door. It had a mosaic that said, warning, genius at work. Perfect timing, Aggie said as she opened the door to Carolyn. Aggie's hair was tied into a kerchief on the top of her head, framing her face in a mass of falling curls. Aggie's studio was a work of art in itself. It was filled with finished pieces that stood on steel tables by the door. Pieces in progress waited for their creator's attention on wooden tables in the middle of the room. Aggie's resource table, which was full of glass shards and bits of jewels and fragments of tile and scraps of paper, stood in between. Aggie was saying, I'm so happy you're here, Caro. I just got the most amazing news, but now that I think of it, why are you here? You usually call before you come over unless you're psychic, which would be pretty cool, but you've never been psychic before, no offense. I'm here because I have some pretty amazing news too, Carolyn said. It was too big to talk about over the phone, but hey, you go first. No, you go first. No, you, okay, you sure? Aggie said. Carolyn nodded. Okay, Aggie said. Do you want a chair? Because I think you're gonna need one. It was a courteous offer, but as the two friends looked around the room, they realized every horizontal space was taken. Aggie was a collector. Her art was inspired by everyday throwaways which made her furniture home to piles of magazines and take out menus and bottle tops and broken belt buckles and in one case, half a bagel. Well, hold on to me then in case you faint, Aggie said. You ready? The whole beast gallery is giving me a solo show. My first solo show. It's the biggest goal of my adult life, Carol. The thing that always was someday, maybe, and now it's today, it's here. Oh, that is wonderful news, Carolyn said. I know, Aggie said. A solo show at the whole beast is like the world's best Sunday, topped with a cherry, a fresh cherry, not a pickled maraschino one, and lots of whipped cream and a chocolate-covered potato chip on top with a winning lottery ticket balanced on the potato chip. I'm so happy for you, really, Carolyn repeated as happily as she could. And she was truly happy that her best friend was getting her dream come true, her first solo show. But there were 364 other days in the year for Aggie to have had wonderful news. Did she really have to pick Carolyn's big news day? I mean, not that Aggie had done that exactly. I mean, Carolyn's news honestly was actually a couple of days old, but still, she felt annoyed. And feeling annoyed, well, that was annoying. I mean, Carolyn knew she was a bigger person than that, or at least she should have been. Oh, but enough about me. What's your big news, Carol? Aggie was asking, but she wasn't listening, not really. Aggie's face gave her away. Her cheeks were flushed, her lips were parted, her eyes were glowing. Well, Carolyn handed Aggie's Beltram by Beltram's card. That was the card from the fashion designer that was uh, gonna design a dress for Carolyn for the bride and also for Aggie as the bridesmaid. On it, Beltram had written the words, 
please contact us for your maid of honor dress fitting ASAP. Well, who's the maid of honor? Aggie said. You, Carolyn said. And who's the bride? Aggie's eyes, already wide, grew wider. Their expression had looked delighted before, but now they looked wary. Carolyn curtsied. I wanted to tell you in person, but things have happened so fast. How fast are we talking about, Aggie said, a month? Two months? Um, the wedding is, is in two days, Carolyn said. And um, the bridal shower is tomorrow. This is insane, Aggie said. And she didn't say it in her usual, this is insane, as in great tone of voice. She was serious. Well, I know it sounds crazy, Carolyn said, but I don't have a choice. Oh, please, Carolyn. Everyone has a choice, and you're making a stupid one. Give me a second to explain, Carolyn said to Aggie. Once you know everything, I think you'll agree I'm doing the right thing. You don't have to explain. I remember. You gave yourself some stupid deadline to find your perfect guy, and now you're marrying some random guy to save your pride. This isn't just crazy. It's stupid stupid. I'm surprised at you. Was Aggie's tone of voice condescending? Or were Carolyn's ears just overly sensitive? Hey, maybe you shouldn't judge what I'm doing until you hear the whole story, she told her friend. Nothing you could say could change my mind, Carol. I'm sorry. Friends don't let friends marry for math. You know what, Ag? Carolyn said. I've stood by you by, through every crazy dream you've had. Hey, Aggie said. My dream is visionary. The whole Beats Gallery just proved that. Your dream is insane. You can't see it's insane because you're crazy. Am I? Or maybe you're just not smart enough to... <clears throat> Carolyn said. Anger was making her mean. Oh no, go on, Aggie said. I've been waiting for you to tell me this for years, so go ahead. Tell me what you mean. It was a pivotal moment. Carolyn could backtrack and apologize, or she could leap forward in anger. Anger? Or was that jealousy trumped her sense of decency? Look, I'm the smart one, Carolyn blurted out. You're the pretty one. Okay, so maybe using some super smart formula to find true love is strange, and maybe to me, Strange means getting married. And maybe you don't want to get married because beautiful people can have anything or anyone they want. Do you, do you ever see how people look at you? There was her tongue again, outpacing her brain, or more accurately, racing laps around it. Carolyn was listening to herself talking, and she was stunned and a little relieved to hear what she was saying. Was she really that petty? Was she really that mean? Apparently she was, and to her added shame, Acting badly felt really good in a world upside down kind of way. Hey, your chances for love are infinite, Carolyn's tongue was telling Aggie, but mine are not. They're limited. I've done some really crazy things to get where I am right now, and it's been amazing, but it's also been unbelievably scary. I'm not going to waste time explaining that, though, to someone who won't look below the surface of things. Well, she'd said her piece, and then some. Carolyn glared at Aggie, and she was doing her best not to blink because if she blinked, she knew she was going to cry. Aggie picked up one of her newest uh, creations. It was a sculpture of a bird made out of broken soda bottles. Carolyn hadn't seen it before, and she had to admit it was beautiful in Aggie's irresistibly odd way. <sighs> You're not the first person to say that, you know, Aggie said, looking at the bird. I don't even know if the Holbeinst is giving me a show because I'm a good artist or because the curator thinks I'm cute. He told me that, you know, the, um, the, the, your really cute part. Aggie, I am so sorry, Carolyn said. For your information, Aggie continued, Tim has asked me to marry him a bunch of times, and I keep saying no. You know why? Because I want him to stick around because he wants to, not because we're tied together with a piece of paper. I thought you were on my side. Aggie put the sculpture back on the table. But maybe I'm just another landmark to you. Then Carolyn heard Aggie sigh a Camus. The sigh Takan Katan called a sigh of why. People sighed at Camus where family issues were concerned, Katan had told her. And that made a sad kind of sense. She and Aggie were self-selected sisters. Anyway, Carol, Aggie said, I think you should leave. I have work to do. And uh, you have a wedding to plan? I do, Carolyn said. She turned to leave, and as she did, she saw the mirror that Aggie had given her. 
You gotta believe, the letters insisted. Oh, I'm trying, Carolyn said, as she closed the studio door behind her. Now the night blew by, by, blew by, blew by, the night blew by in a blur. Carolyn felt angry and excited, delightful, tearful, hopeful, and miserable at the same time. Jimmy Foss was still missing. Aggie was furious with her, understandably. Ned Allen was off traveling. Her parents, little Hans and Miss Chupesky, were amusing themselves who knew where. And that left Carolyn alone with her thoughts. And all of them, some of them many years old, were demanding her attention, although her hands were keeping busy with a very demanding task. If I hadn't tracked down Jimmy's family, ouch, she'd cut her finger. Not badly, but enough to break into her train of thought. If I'd only told Aggie earlier, ouch, she'd cut her finger again. If I joined the family business, ouch, if the moon were made of green cheese, ouch, ouch, ouch. Karen let each one of these ifs have their say. And then she dismissed them from her mind. I'm leading this tour, she said, as she bid her dad's goodbye and good luck somewhere else. I'm not sure where I'm going, so you can't get lost. I mean, you guys can get lost, because I'm taking it one step at a time. She had finished her work of handiwork. She opened her closet and pulled out a short sleeve cotton dress covered with embroidered roses. She bought it for herself at the flea market on her way home from Aggie's. It's for your shower? The owner of Bright is the New Black said. Congratulations on 15% off for the bride. The next morning, Carolyn bandaged her fingers, slipped into the dress, and headed to La Calista for her bridal shower. She was expecting to see the little diner looking as it usually did, a stern symphony of black and white and steel. But Avrique Catan was a talented interior decorator. Silk gardenias covered the walls. Pale green tablecloths covered each table. Silver place settings glowed on each tabletop. What do you think, my miracle? Catan Catan said as he greeted Carolyn at the door of La Calista. It's amazing, Carolyn agreed. I'm glad you like it. Avri Catan said, excuse me, please, I must ship some things on the buffet. Miss Chupesky and Carolyn's mother were organizing the dessert station. Has anyone seen that cake cutter? Carolyn heard Miss Chupesky ask. I placed it halfway between the spoons and the plates to create a right angle, but now it's gone. Oh, I had it a moment ago, Carolyn heard her mother say, but I lost it. Ned's parents and his sister Malin were running the crepe station. Penny for your thoughts. Ned Allen said, walking through the door. He'd just arrived from the airport and was still holding his travel bag. Or should I ask what happened to your hands? Carolyn told Ned about her fight with Aggie. Did you guys fight it out with box cutters? Ned was studying the bandages on her fingers. Oh, no, no, no. I got this making Aggie's apology, Carolyn told him. See, I, I decided to make her a mosaic. So I bought some buttons and some jewelry and some tiles at the flea market and I smashed them with a hammer. And that part was pretty easy. But when I started gluing them together, uh, who knew broken things have sharp edges? The mirror that Aggie had made for Carolyn to help her recover from her heartbreak had said, you gotta believe in silver letters. The mirror that Carolyn had made for Aggie said, 100% smart art. The letters A-R-T were in different colors, which Carolyn thought was a pretty nifty touch. So it was smart and art at the same time. But would it heal the breach? Carolyn had left the mirror with Aggie's doorman late that last night. Now all she could do was hope. Look, weddings make people do crazy things, Ned sighed. Carolyn squeezed his hand gently with her less damaged fingers. Ned's fiance had left him days before their wedding. This wasn't an easy time for him either, Carolyn knew. But luckily, Ned's pain was fluting. Hey, look at those wheels, he said with boyish glee, pointing to the street. A turquoise car with white trim and impressively large back fins was parallel parking outside the door. The car's vanity license plate read, Blue Eyes. It wasn't easy to park the car. It was the size of two normal vehicles, but the driver didn't seem to mind. The car slipped in the custom-fitted space between a motorcycle and a minivan, and then with impressive choreography, the car's front and back doors opened in unison. Four sets of stiletto shoes emerged, followed by four pairs of white gloves and four pastel dresses, with the four wives of the Friends of Frank pertly packed inside them. This way, ladies! Barbara Sinatra, the wife of the fourth Frank, led the other woman from the car to the cafe. The four women tapped their way across the linoleum floor on four sets of spiky high heels. Happy bridal shower, darling! The first wife of Frank told Carolyn as she walked through the door. Thank you, Carolyn said. 
You don't remember her name, do you? The spunky wife of the third Frank challenged the first. Maybe I don't, but what's it to you? The first wife says. I'm just saying it shows a lack of manners, the first wife said. I'm just saying. Well, look who's talking about manners, the third wife said. Miss, I was his mistress, now I'm his wife. Ladies, Barbara Sinatra said, this is not the time or the place to argue. Hey, who's the supermodel? Aggie was standing on La Calista's threshold, arm in arm with Tim. Call me nuts, she said, holding up Carolyn's mirror. But is somebody here getting married? The shower became a happy blur for Carolyn after that. It was the perfect day to celebrate everything, her wedding, her friendships, her family, her life. Party guests from all different parts of her world were mixing and mingling. Nico, wearing a blue suit, a crisp white shirt, and a red tie in place of his black and white waiter's uniform, chatted with the friends of Frank's wives. Grimelda, his partner in owning La Calista, was outfitted in a little black dress. She stood beside him. Carolyn had never seen Grimelda smile before. The look suited her. I know you, one of the wives of Frank was saying to Nico. Did you hear that? Grimelda said to Nico. The lady knows you. Say something. Perhaps uh, they have tasted our cafe, Nico said, pointing to La Calista's coffee urns. It's not your coffee. It's you, the Frank's wife was saying. Something about you is very familiar to me. Tell them who you are, Grimelda told Nico. I will not, Nico said. Why not, Grimelda said. I will not, Nico said. It would make people happy. Maybe even you, Grimelda argued. Nico shook his head. One of the Frank's wives was continuing the conversation. Where are your people from? Well, Grimelda said, there is a very well-known song written about our island where we lived as a child. Nico knows this song very well. Psh, Nico said and headed for the kitchen. Silly man, Grimelda said and followed him, followed by Carolyn through the swinging doors. La Calista's kitchen was as well ruled as its owners. Stainless steel pots and pans dotted the wall. Dishes were lined up in perfect stacks and open frame shelving units. I will not do this. I will not tell them. Nico stood in the middle of the room, protesting between the sink and the flatware. That's why, Grimelda said. They will laugh at me, Nico said. That isn't true, Carolyn said, startling them both. I know who you are now, and I think it's amazing. She told Nico what she'd figured out. But how did you figure this out? Nico asked Carolyn. I followed one of La Calista's unwritten rules, Carolyn smiled. I eavesdropped. So what will you do now? Nico asked Carolyn. That's up to you, Carolyn said. I can keep your secret, or I can introduce you to someone. We have been waiting for this our whole lives, Grimelda said wide-eyed when Carolyn finished her explanation. But what if we fail, said Nico. Oh, you won't fail, Carolyn said. At least, I don't think you will. I can't guarantee anything, but I have a good feeling. But why now, after all these years? Nico shook his head. Grimelda cupped her hand against Nico's cheek and looked into his eyes. Because, Nicolo, it is time. And you will be beside me? The normally brusque Nico whispered to Grimelda. Forever, Grimelda smiled. No matter what happens. Then my answer? My answer is yes, Nico said. Uh, 30 second pause if anyone wants the last cupcake or we'll just keep going because it's dark. Keep going. If you want the last cupcake, talk to Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> there was cake and there were toasts and there were gifts to be opened and acknowledged. Carolyn appreciated all of that, but she was focusing on tomorrow as well. She had made the call and the answer was yes. Now all she had to do was, well, nothing. That wasn't easy at first. She kept picturing what might happen, but there was no way of knowing. And while her mind was focusing on the future, her body knew she just had a really big day. And so she went to bed, expecting to toss and turn all night, but she fell asleep as soon as her head touched the pillow. A minute later, it seemed, her alarm clock was buzzing in the dark. She quieted the alarm and headed to the bathroom. She remembered her first day of high school, how it felt to be walking into a dream that might have some rough edges, but was still a dream come true. She pulled on her clothes and headed out to work in the city's relatively quiet pre-dawn. The tour she was leading today had multiple parts. Two familiar figures were setting the tables at La Calista, and that was part one. Carolyn knocked on the window and waved. 
Ellen and Alan Allen waved back at her from behind the counter at La Calista. The next part was the part that really mattered. Carolyn had enough time to walk, but she ran toward the river. Patience was a virtue, but indifference truly was overrated. Chapter 22. The team from Righteous Records met Carolyn at sunrise on a crumbling pier by the Hudson River. The scene looked like it could have been filmed 50 years earlier. The light of early day cast a black and white lens over the setting. The pier's boards were weathered, even rotted in some places. The buildings across the water looked time-worn. Natalie Martino looked at home, dressed in her uniform of black on black. The grip is gripping, she told Carolyn. This place, it has atmosphere. But where's the, uh, the hidden star? Down here? Carolyn pointed to a rusty metal ladder on the side of the pier. Ah, oh, good thing I wore my low-heeled boots, Natalie Martino said. As she descended the ladder, the group followed her. I gotta hand it to you. This place is bleak, Natalie Martino told Carolyn when everyone had landed down below. Strands of barbed wire, urban tumbleweed, poked through the dirty um, sand with, pizza, uh, with pieces of paper that had tumbled onto its spiky arms. The paper's faded colors fluttered in the breeze like flags of so many war-torn countries. Natalie Martino scanned the horizon. Should there be, a, I don't know, a grove down here or a hidden building or a something? Carolyn shook her head. So where's the, the, the thing that has the hidden star? Carolyn pointed to the sand. Thousands of immigrants landed on Ellis Island, she told Natalie Martino, but this location was the landing site for many others. They were less official, but equally hopeful about their new home in America. Ooh, I like this. Go on, Natalie Martino said. Well, the story in this sand is the story of a young couple. They arrived here with a song they had written together, inspired by a story they had heard as children, living on a small fishing island. She reached into her satchel and pulled out a small battery-operated phonograph. <coughs> this is the rehearsal record they brought with them, she said, removing a vinyl photograph record and placing it on the uh, phonograph. And this is the song they brought across the sea. Carolyn lowered the needle onto the record. Violins began the melody. A few measures later, a man began to speak in the unheard style of a time and place far away. In the village by the sea where I lived as a child, the man said, the fisherman sang this song. It is the song of a lady and an island called Callista. A woman's voice joined the man's voice. Callista, they sang in harmony. Oh, this is good, James said. Shh. Natalie Martino held up her hand. In the language of our island, Callista means most lovely. Callista, the men sing as they cast their nets into the sea. Callista, mon im, mon ange, mon vie, when will you show your love for me? Oh, that's it. Natalie Martino told Carolyn. There's no doubt about it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our song. The Righteous Records team applauded. Natalie Martino took call to uh, turned to James. We need an ad campaign. We need billboards. We need movie placement. Most of all, we need two singers to replace the dead guys on this record. Are you sure about that? Carolyn said. And as Carolyn said those words, Nika and Grimelda emerged hand in hand from behind the rocks. When will you show your love for me, Nico sang. Kalista, the pair sung in harmony. You're alive, Natalie Martino stared at Grimelda and Nico. Well, obviously, Grimelda said. And are you signed to anybody else's label? <laughs> Nico replied. And so it was there at dawn, on the sand, below the pier, by the Hudson River, that Grimelda Vincento and Nicolo Patriandando signed a contract with Righteous Records. And as Natalie Martino would soon discover, she had met her match in Grimelda. Natalie acted tough, Grimelda was tough. Your song? It's the real thing, Natalie told Grimelda as she signed a contract on the dotted line. I know, Grimelda said, pocketing her copy of the document. No, no, I'm serious, Natalie Martino said. I never joke, Grimelda told Natalie. Now, Righteous Records was giving Nico and Grimelda a huge signing bonus, but the label's hottest, newest recording artists insisted on keeping their day jobs running their little diner. But that's crazy, Natalie Martino said. We need to have meetings. We need to have studio sessions. We can't do that if you're serving coffee and ringing bells. 
Nico pointed to the takeout counter of La Calista, where Carolyn had led the group to celebrate. Of course we can. We'll have our meetings here. You gotta be kidding me. Natalie Martino raised her voice a little too much. Ding! Grimelda rang her bell. By noon, Natalie Martino had opened a satellite office of Righteous Records at La Calista. She installed two landlines and an internet router at her table. James, Natalie's second command, was given a satellite satellite office at the lunch counter. And then, as surely as Nico and Grimelda brewed their coffee, Natalie Martino cooked up a hit record. Callista Unmixed began to play in constant rotation on the little cafe's speakers. Music reporters arrived. Photographers and video crews followed. Nico and Grimelda met with all of them when they weren't serving breakfast or lunch. So uh, let me get the story right. You guys are uh, holding on to your humble roots while you reach for the stars, huh? A reporter asked Nico. Fame is fleeting, Nico told the man. But fresh, hot cafe is forever. And with that, we end episode 10, leading to our final episode of Blame It on Hoboken. Thank you for listening. Love our atmosphere. Thank you, Michelle and Scott, for having us. Um, we will see you here. Next week is the last week, so if you know anyone who uh, wants to come, <laughs> that, that would be the time. We'll catch them up. Um, tune in, stay tuned. We're going to sing our little theme song, and then we're going to roll it off into the night. Two by two. Out there in the parking lot, the stars came shining through. They drew a heart, and in one part, they smelled at me and me. Oh, star shine, shines a good old light. Oh, star shine, everything's alright. The day's been dark and cloudy, and good luck seems passing through. Up in the sky, away up high, the stars will come to you. You, 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 you. Looking for a clover in a field of broken glass. A wondering things over, asking if the die were cast. Well, out there in the distance, the stars turned on at last. Right in the end, they said, my friend, you're moving way too fast. Oh, star shine, shines a good old light. Oh, star shine, everything's all right. Day's been dark and cloudy, and good luck seems passing through. Up in the sky, away up by the stars.
mile in the distance, an eon in the past. The nights of velvet blanket dotted with bright lights that cast. I shaped every night and I dreamed every mast. So he dreams to every dreamer and they yes to all we ask. Oh, star shine, shines a good old light. Oh, star shine, everything's all right. The day's been dark and cloudy and good luck seems passing through. Up in the sky, away up high, the stars will talk to you. Up in the sky, away up high, the stars will tell you true. Enjoy the starry night. See you next week.